Okay, so starting the presentation and the title is how do I know if my idea is a good one, because everybody's got an idea and the way you find out is literally ask your customer. Uh, you don't want to just talk to yourself or believe what what you think is true. And the reasons why you do this is that the greatest reason for failure is you built something that nobody really wanted or needed, or the current solution is good enough. So this whole thing is about preventing that from happening, from you wasting time and money. So the, if people do this at all, they do it wrong. Um, they go around, you know, they have wireframes or whatever, and they show people and say, what do you think of my idea? Or they talk about it. So already you're off track. So what customer discovery is, there's the right way, it's called customer discovery. And this is now built into the lexicon of all entrepreneurship, uh, probably driven a lot by the National Science Foundation in their program about trying to get all this great research our taxpayer dollars are paying for to get it out onto the market. So I'm gonna tell you how to do it the right way. So customer relationships are in three phases. The first one is customer discovery. And it's just very simply, are you solving the right problem? Validation comes later, and this is where most people say that you think, oh, I know I'm solving the right problem, then here's how I'm solving it. What do you think of it? And of course, the last thing, the most importantly, is actually getting customers. So I'm going to focus only on customer discovery today. So what is it? What is the pain or problem that people are experiencing? Who, this is gonna be your buyer, your users, is having the problem? How bad is the pain? And so what I say, if you go into a doctor and you say, I've got a pain in my stomach, they all, always ask you on a scale of one to 10, how bad is that pain? And you're looking for pains of eight, nines, and tens, where it's really a big problem. So how are this who currently dealing with it? Whatever they're doing, that is the competition, even if it's doing nothing. However they're solving it or tried to solve it is, is, um, is the competition. So what you want to do after you find out how they're solving it now or what they tried to do, how's that working for you? So using the same analogy, if we asked them on a scale of one to 10, you know, how is that current solution working? You're looking for a one, two, or three. Big pain or problem, eight, nine, and 10, where the current solutions are one, two, and three. If it starts to get in the middle, even though it might be a good idea, it ends up not taking off because it's just not a bad enough pain or the current solutions are just good enough that people sort of stick with the, what they know. So this is all driven, it's the scientific method. You have a hypothesis or an assumption about what is the problem. You find a ways to test that. Um, you evaluate what you just learned and then you go and you revise your test. This is what happens in laboratories when you think you have you know, the right culture or the medium. So uh, it starts out with a business thesis. And that is very simply, who is the customer? So I'll give you an example. If somebody says, it's, um, I hear insurance companies, that was Mike. Well, the answer is no, insurance companies don't write checks. So who in the insurance company, a name or a title, the title of the individual, and maybe it's the claims manager, I'm making that up, I don't know, um, will buy, will lease, will integrate my solution um, or talk to the car companies to integrate my solution in order to reduce their insurance claims by some percentage. So that's the business thesis that you wanna test. So you believe that one, it's less expensive, but the other side of it is, does it actually reduce accidents? How much does it have to reduce the accident in order to be effective? Because you gotta find something that the customer values. So who is the customer? What is your product solution and why will they buy it? So I'm gonna talk a little bit about customers. So the NSF uses the term broadly. I call them stakeholders because customer to me is a little bit more explicit. The ones you really want to pay attention to during customer discovery is your user and your decision maker in particular. So the reason why I'm making a little bit difference in there, if you are making a child's toy, the child is the user, but the decision maker who's going to decide to buy it is going to be the parent, the guardian, or um, you know, somebody at the school who buys supplies. 
The other thing you just want to keep an eye out for is what I call the saboteur. And these are the individuals that it threatens their job. Um, they have some sort of sway or information too, but usually during customer discovery, particularly if you're dealing with the B2B, business to business world, there could be a saboteur in there. And I'll give you an example a little bit later. So creating a business thesis, and if we were actually there, this is the, uh, we would do go through the exercise and uh, just heads up here, uh, Anthony, we're gonna do this tomorrow night in the uh, NSFI core uh, kickoff class in there. So. Um, oh, great. Okay. So value propositions in there. What does the customer care about? What really matters to them? So the reason why I'm emphasizing this because you think that this is what your customer is wanting. But here's a real quick example. Um, I have a printer in my office that prints out 20 pages a minute and it costs me five cents a page. And you come in and you say, hey, I can reduce your cost of your printing down to two cents a page. Will you buy my new printer? I said, I don't care about the cost. I want something that does 60 pages a minute. Uh, because my value is speed, whereas what you're selling is cost reduction. So sometimes people get that wrong um, because they don't actually listen closely to what the customer is, uh, what, what they will pay for. So just for anybody who's technical in there and they're not buying your technology, they're buying a solution to their problems. I mean, how many of you, when you go to buy a car, actually want that salesperson to talk endlessly about the engine and what the throughput is and all that other stuff. You don't really care. What you really care about, miles per gallon and um, the repair rate. You know, it's, it's, so um, you can describe the technology a little bit, but don't use it um, excessively. So here are some great value propositions. Um, again, it matters what matters to the customer. And I'm not gonna read these to you. I've got like three pages of them. Um, there's some things and it will vary from depending on what you're doing in the industry. So um, this is what I would have you do. What is your, I would have you create your business thesis. And if it's a smaller group, some people might have it right away and we can, I can give you some feedback. Once you have your thesis, then you have to come up with your hypotheses or assumptions that then what questions are you gonna to ask to test these assumptions? So um, what makes a good hypothesis? It's clear, it's concise, specific, and you can measure it, you can test it. So um, sample hypotheses is the problem my stakeholder wants to solve is, so just fill in, finish those sentences. Um, so there's a different examples you can use. You don't have to use them all, but just a way to think about it in order to get this done. And then um, what you need to do is think of the possible customer segments and specific stakeholders. And Mike, I'm gonna use yours again. I hope you don't mind. Um, your customer segments was actually the driver. Uh, you talked about somebody in the insurance, but we need to get more specific about that. It could be the car manufacturers, that this could be a competitive edge for them in order to you know, promote the safety of their car. But you have to pick one customer segment to start out with, the one that you think is going to be the most receptive to this. So it could be an aftermarket product that I, I already have my car that I can install myself, don't know. Um, so then it's a B to C. And so you want to talk, find people who care about their insurance rates and um, maybe have teenage drivers <laughs> um, that are more yeah. prone to accidents. Yeah. So create a business thesis for each of those. So you would say parents of teenage children um, would lead, buy my product in order to keep their child safer or reduce their accident rate or reduce the, it could be that you think they want to reduce their insurance rate. So how do you test this? So we're going to, you're going to come up with some questions to test that. Um, remember that there could be, as I just gave you the example, multiple industries or segments and or different target audiences for this. So just try to pick one, but I would go first for looking at 
market size, where the problem is worse, um, where you have a better chance of competing, there is no alternative. So uh, look again about who your customer stakeholders are. And just, I would just get some people to brainstorm with you about some possible questions to prove or disprove the hypothesis or the assumptions. And uh, it's easy to ask a lot of questions, but I would prioritize five to seven of them um, because the, uh, not everybody's going to want to give you our interviews in there. So make sure that you get some that are measurable. And so my favorite question, which I tend to overuse, is on a scale of one to 10. Uh, or how many times in the past three months or past year, I don't know what the time frame is, um, as opposed to did you ever, um, that's not very helpful. Um, what steps, uh, what are the steps you need to take to, how much did you pay for? So that's very specific. But then you wanna also include some qualitative types of things. What did you like most about, the least about? Can you give me an example of the last time, da da da. So this is literally, it's on our website. If you go to cmu.edu slash Olympus, this entire presentation is on the website and there is a customer interview guide, which you can download and you can use to um, prepare this. And on the back is sample hypotheses. So you again, Philip, complete those sentences. So here's some sample questions. I'm not gonna go into them all. Um, but just to give you an idea of the types, different types of questions you could ask. By the way, I'm gonna go back to that. I just wanna say, who else should I talk to? Uh, you get into companies and I have an example at the end uh, or into organizations and you have no idea that sometimes these positions exist and they can be extremely important to interview. Um, that again, oh, I'm going the wrong way, sorry. So starting out, you want to warm them up a little bit. So I would ask them about their job title position or how long they've been in the job. Um, or they've been there 10 days, 10 years. Um, that will give you an idea of the expertise or the experience that they're bringing to the table. I don't really count that as part of the five to seven um, because you just want to know a little bit more about it. You will have a different set of questions for the different stakeholders. So there's no way getting around that because the, what you would do, for example, in that child's toy, what you would look for for the child is gonna be different than what the questions you wanna ask the parent. Avoid the have you ever, um, because that's simply a yes or no, you don't learn much. Just when was the last time um, is actually much more uh, helpful. And the other question to avoid is would you? This has tripped up major marketers. Uh, Coca-Cola made this mistake when they were going to announce a new brand. They asked people, would you? And people said, sure. And then nobody did. One of my, this great team, great team, uh, and they had a, uh, a service for students on campus and they went around and interviewed CMU students, Pitt students. They went down to Chatham. They went to Point Park and they asked all these students, would you? 90% said yes. And when they launched it, fewer than 10% did. So what you wanna do is try, this was an app. So what you wanted to do is actually find out if they have, what they have done in the past that may be indicative of what they could, would do in the future. Okay. Then you, here's the exercise in who to interview, look for your buyers, decision makers, users, and influencers. Careful of what I call subject matter experts. Um, they are not necessarily your buyer or user. They may know a lot about the field. Uh, it's like, yeah, I will talk about it, like professors or faculty know an awful lot about robotics, but they're not the ones who are, if you're not designing your product to actually be sold to faculty, they are not a user or a buyer, but they might know a lot about the industry or more importantly, know people in the industry. So, um, I think Mike, you again had problems of where to find them. Um, just go on and look for, um, well, obviously best if you start with people you know, 
we have a section on our website called uh, domain experts and these are over 130 some people who from various fields that have already volunteered to help you they're going to give you a half hour of their time um, no charge particularly for the lawyers um, but they come in over 40 different industries and so they've already signed up to help and they will can be helpful but there are other local organizations. I did a program for um, the Jewish Health Foundation and looked around at the different organizations in town. LinkedIn, um, look for alums who are in like the insurance agencies. It, um, and national organizations and speakers or authors because they're already public. So in this case, there is an industry map for every industry. And in this case, what I did is I just said, search healthcare industry maps. And these are only four that came up. And you can't read this, but um, 106 startups actually in the healthcare space. There's another one, which is they're transforming it, medical devices, internet of things. So they come in different categories and they clump them together. And these are organizations you've probably never heard of, um, but they are all worthy of in exploring and interviewing. There's one on drones. There's one on fashion. There's one on chemicals. This one's really important because chemicals always has the equivalent of what I call the food chain, that different products intersect at different points along the way. And so this explains a little bit of who's in what, what verticals, self-driving autos, um, you know, the, who are the organizations that are participating or playing a part. Uh, trade associations. There is a trade association for everything. And if you look down, they have um, members and they also have associate members. And these are the ones that uh, maybe suppliers or indirectly are involved, but they usually have the names of the company and often you, they have a contact name. And this is publicly available. Here's something on batteries. We've had a couple battery startups in there too. And as you can see on the right-hand side, you can see the alphabetical list. I'm not even, I'm into the L's there. So I only got half of the, the list of the individuals. Um, here's one on payment systems. Here's one on smart traffic. Um, societies in the medical field. So, that's a good place to start. So find the name of the company and then maybe using LinkedIn, see if you can find, put in CMU and then uh, the name of the company and you can find alums because they're often much more willing to help you um, if you're having trouble to get in. So how to do these interviews? First of all, well, it's harder now, but what I call get out of the building. Uh, you cannot Google your way through this. You actually have to talk to real people. Zoom and Skype work beautifully, uh, as we all know. In fact, in some cases, people are more accessible because it's really uh, kind of a quick way to connect. If you were in person, um, I had somebody who was going and had a product for a hospitals and he signed up, he got the TB test and he shadowed the nurses and the patients and the caregivers to observe what they were doing. And he learned a lot more than by simply asking questions because sometimes he didn't know which questions to ask. You can do telephone, online surveys, and I'm quoting Steve Blank, who's sort of the father of the modern startup system in there. Online surveys are crap. When was the last time you answered an, a survey from an anonymous, um, a random survey from an anonymous person, somebody you didn't know? People don't. So what you do is you send out your emails or you post it to people that you pretty much know and statistically you probably have a tainted sample or they're not particularly your users or your buyers. So the technique, 15 minutes, five to seven questions. When I learned when I was participating in the National Science Foundation I core team, one of the national ones, that everybody will give you 15 minutes. Nobody wants to sign up for a half hour because they don't know what they're signing up for. You can get five to seven quality questions answered in that period of time. So when I was doing it, I was on a team, actually they came in number third in the X, um, the X prize, it was Marinus Analytics, and they were dealing, I was cold calling law enforcement, Department of Justice, FBI, Department of Homeland Security, 
officers or people who worked in there because they were looking for human trafficking um, detection. And these are really busy people who didn't know me from squat. And I said, 15 minutes, I promise it won't take any more than that. Um, and grudgingly, grudgingly, they gave me that 15, they said, okay. Then I couldn't get them off the phone. I was hitting a really, I was asking questions about something they cared passionately about. Problem, 10. Current solution, one. Their solution was tips. That's the best they could do to, you know, to catch these people. So um, in fact, I had one guy who just said, I really gotta go. Can, I, can we finish this conversation tomorrow? And I said, sure. So, and then they gave me lots of other people that I should call, um, more than happy to um, set it and made, making introductions for me. So absolutely clear, you cannot talk about your idea. This is 100% focused on the customer's problem, not your solution. You'll do that later. But as soon as you start to talk about your solution, you have skewed the conversation. You are, as they say, leading the witness. Um, you have changed the way they're thinking about it. They're going to try to help you with their solution before you're 100% certain um, you're solving the right problem. So to get started, um, I'm doing some research on XX Next. You're all either current uh, employees or, or faculty. So I would absolutely use the student card or the CMU card. I've had more uh, of my startups who have done this said it's a door opener. The credibility of CMU uh, right away gives you, um, you know, professional stature in there. Um, you can start with a few what I call friends or friendlies. Um, these are people either you know or people like on our domain expert list who pretty much know this process because in the beginning, your questions either aren't going to be very good or you're not very experienced about presenting them. And you're going to get some weird answers and you go, well, I got to ask that question differently. But then as soon as you feel like you got your sea legs, then go after people you don't know. They will be much more direct and honest with you. You don't have to go to the C-suite. The C CEO, CTO, CFO, um, if you're getting into businesses, I, you can start down lower. Um, and I find, by the way, if you can find salespeople, they know the market, they know the competition really well, and they're really trying to hustle and sell things. And so they have a good sense of what the customers are after. Remember, particularly in corporations, who else should I talk to? And occasionally, what else should I have asked? because you're pretty much focused on where, what you're trying to get after. And then occasionally they'll bring up, it's, oh, well, we just got a call from a salesperson who's come up with the new solution that's coming in. Oh, so when that happens, just say, tell me more. So this is going to be a real time saver, um, the talking to humans, and then there's testing with humans. Gift Constable um, wrote this. It is online, you can get a PDF, it's free. Uh, as I said, I read it over lunch. Um, and if you want to buy it for um, ebooks or something or Kindle, it's a dollar. So because they make you pay, you charge something for it. The other thing I would suggest while you're doing this is sign up for the premium version of LinkedIn, your ability to connect and go to those second and third degree levels um, will happen. And then it's after you're done, you can go back to the, the, the free version. Okay, these questions are not a checklist. What they are is a prompt for you. Uh, and because what you really wanna do is you wanna listen carefully to what people are saying and then iterate based upon what they're saying. So your questions will shift or you'll kind of go down deeper on certain, certain topics. So here's the hints of how the magic happens. Always ask, how are you solving it now or tried to solve it? And then on a scale of one to 10, how would you rate that solution? After they give you a number, say, why did you give it that number? I don't care if they gave it a 10 or a one. So write down everything they say in the order they're saying it and in their own words. Here's why. They're giving you the feature list. So I've had people come in and say, I'm going to do this, this, this in my system. And you say, all this long things that you're going to do. But what they're doing is they're giving it not only the list of what's important to them, why they liked it or why they didn't like it, 
um, they're giving you the priority. The first thing that comes out is the thing that usually matters the most to them and so forth. And uh, they're giving you the marketing language. This is how they talk about the solutions or what's on the market. So eventually you're gonna to have to sell this and this really good salespeople listen to what you say and then they sort of pair it back to you. Well, I have a solution that does such and such and go, oh, that sounds like something I could use. Um, and they're also telling you what the competition is. I 100% guarantee you, you're gonna find things that you didn't even know that people are using or knew about. So second thing is listen for the unexpected. So um, if they say something that seems like, oh, wow, that wasn't expecting that, just say, tell me more. And if there is substance to it, so this is something you didn't even know you should be asking or thinking about. Um, you can go back to past interviews and say, you know, I just have one more question you were very helpful for, but I have one more, could you help? And include it in your, inter your next interviews. Your, this, your whole interviews, your hypotheses and the questions you're testing will evolve as you go along. This is where the pivots happen. And it's, you want to do this now. People want to get it right away in there and start building. Well, you don't want to build until you're 100% sure you're solving the right problem for the right target audience. And do this just research. It costs you nothing but time um, before you actually begin to build anything. So I'm going to give you a real quick example. It was called Smart Bell. It was two Tepper MBAs and an engineer. They were all workout buffs. Uh, they came into my office one day and they said, we're the type, we write down everything we do on every workout routine. One of them kept a little notebook, the other, somebody else did something on their phone, I forget what else. But what we're gonna do is we're gonna have a chip, a little sensor that you can put on each of those machines. And those machines will know what I'm doing, how often I'm doing it and the, the level we're doing it. And then it will send that information onto an app on our phone. And they had already done a survey, online survey. Um, and everybody said it was a great idea. I said, okay, we're gonna do this a little differently. We're gonna come up with sort of the questions asked and I want you to go down to the CMU gym and stop random strangers. I want you to go over to the pit gym, same thing. There's a gold gym, not too far away. And there was another one up on Squirrel Hill. And I want you to ask these people the question. So they came back and they looked a little sheepish and said, well, we found out most people don't care. So why do I need to write it down? I do the same thing most of the times when I go in, I have my set routines. Um, it's just not as that important. He said, there were some people that really cared, but we thought a lot more people would. But they said, what happened is everybody was saying, it's not what I do on the machines. It's getting on the machines. It's the lines or the waiting. I said, and everybody complained about that. I said, ah. Uh -huh tell me more. So we changed, instead of going and interviewing customers or users, um, I said, go talk to the managers of this gym and see if this is a problem for them. And they came back, different set of questions, and they came back and said, wow, we hit. And they were about ready to you know, pull out. People come up and they complain all the time. And apparently there's something about leg machines. <laughs> um, they said, there's always a line at the leg machine. You need to get another machine. And he was saying, they were saying, well, first of all, I don't have infinite amount of space. If I had got another leg machine, what am I going to get rid of? Um, secondly, he said, you know, I can walk around, but I don't know how much everything is being used. I, I don't really have an idea. And you think it's bad now? Wait till one of the machines break down. You know to take your car in every 5,000 miles and get the tune-up. He said, I have no idea when to bring in the repairman to tighten the you know, the bolts or oil, the whatever it is in there too. I said, I just have absolutely no data on any of that and I would pay for it. Cha -ching, cha -ching. Um, and so what they did is, and the engineer said, this is so much easier. I could just put a standard off the shelf sensor on each of the machines and I can create the Yelp um, and have it on your website so people can go through and they can see when the machines are used most frequently and when they're not. So they went back and did some more customer discovery interviews and pe found people had flexibility of when they went to the gym. 
and if they actually had pretty good indications that at four o'clock on uh, Tuesdays and Thursdays, the leg machines were the most available, they would change, they could change the routine. So, and the gym managers loved it. Um, they said also, this would be really good for attracting and retaining customers because they would get better uses of the machines. So hopefully I'm convincing you um, that, so they did a total pivot without building one single thing, total pivot. So here's a real quick case study. It's called Risk Call. Uh, it was for um, a smartwatch that the patients wore that they could call the nurse from anywhere, not just by the, the, call, phone, the, the call bell that's tethered to the wall next to the bed. And there, the nurses had a similar one that they could see if the patient in 32B needed help and the type of help. There was also a nurse at the nurse's station, there was a, um, um, a, a um, tracking the number of calls that came in. This came up because he himself had been in the hospital and he had tried to call the nurse at night and the nurse didn't come, the nurse didn't come. He got out of bed and tried to help himself um, to actually go call for help. He fell and he hurt himself, happily not seriously. And he said, you know, this, is, this was pretty bad. Um, I just wonder how big a problem it is. So here's his business thesis is, the customer for hospital administrators, very specific people, would lease the smart call watches and response time tracking platform in order to reduce the number of injuries patients occur when not responded to. And he had in there quickly, um, didn't know if there was actually a time frame. So that was the business thesis he started out with. His hypotheses, and I am gonna read this a little bit. Slow response leads to serious and expensive injuries. Nurses are not responding faster because of lack of awareness. Um, hospital administrators want to and would pay for a new product service to reduce these injuries. And hospital administrators would pay for data on number of requests and response time. So target segments were hospitals and nursing homes potentially. And then who were the stakeholders the users, nurses, and patients, I'm not gonna read this all for you. One of the questions they had down, do insurance companies care? Um, who didn't know who the economic buyer was. Um, potential saboteur could be the IT people because they don't like putting in new systems. Um, and, but he did use industry data, this is where Google can work, um, to learn the size of the problem. Uh, so he actually shadowed and observed. Uh, he did a lot of interviewing of nurses, nurse administrators, um, found out the doctors actually didn't care. Uh, it was more of a hospital uh, administration problem. So you can see there was a whole list of the different types of people that he interviewed. And so this is one I'm gonna go through a little bit more in depth. Um, the nurse administrator actually comes up with a staffing schedule. So how do you learn that a patient needs help? That's the current solution. And the two were the call bell and a light over the door were the two most common. Um, what do you like most about it? What do you like least about it? So that's the competitive assessment. How often the past week uh, was response platform unmanned in this case that they couldn't see that a patient had called. And what they found out is that a lot of this happens at night when the staffing levels are lower and the nurse is actually in another room helping another patient has no idea that somebody like Srinath actually needed help. Um, who else should you talk to? Um, and what they found out is that the nurses actually wanted to be able to be more responsive. They just didn't know that um, people were happening, uh, um, people needed help. And then we wanted to find out what happens when a patient injures him or herself. Turns out that the um, insurance companies didn't care because if you injure yourself while you're in that hospital, the hospital pays, not the insurance company. Um, so again, this is on our website and it's also going to be on the um, Schwartz Center uh, workshop archives in there. So what he found out, it's a huge problem. One, $1.2 billion annual for the hospitals coming out of their pocket. It occurs, found out that if 
people are not responded to within two and a half minutes, then they try to get help themselves. And that's where the injuries take place. And here was the biggie. Medicare is beginning to reimburse hospitals in general based upon their number of stars, their patient satisfaction. And hospitals were looking for ways to improve their ratings because they make more money. And there was a position he had no idea existed. Patient satisfaction manager is the one who was you know, finding out from patients what rating they were giving and looking for ways to boost it up. Um, IT people didn't care because he was just using the existing internet and the buyer decision maker was the CFO. And importantly, he found out that he had gone to um, four hospitals and two nursing homes and we were trying to find one that would do a 10 bed test for 30 days. And getting hospitals to do anything with patients or do a testing was almost impossible. Um, but we thought we would try. So we went out to all six and just prayed that somebody would say yes. And they all signed up. And he said, I don't have that many watches and they're expensive. He said, um, how do I pick? And I said, well, let's charge him. How much does it cost for this equipment to do this? And he came up with number 5,000. Um, I said, see if they're really serious about this. And so he went out hoping we'd get one to sign up. Everybody signed up. <laughs> so my conclusion was we didn't charge enough. Um, but on the other hand, we weren't trying to make money. We were just trying to validate that somebody cared enough that this was a big enough problem. Which by the way, this is where I, my first real experience of learning that people will pay for pilots if it really is solving a big problem. So he revised his business thesis, uh, CFO and hospital administrators will lease the watches and platform in order to reduce the cost of injuries that patients occur when not responded to quickly in 2.5 minutes and increase patient satisfaction ratings. Which by the way, I will just tell you in general, I've been doing this longer, you now. it's actually 2000, I did it for the private sector. But I've found when you really talk to companies, they're more interested in making more money than they are in reducing costs. So not that they aren't concerned about reducing costs, but the thing that actually sells a little bit more is making more money. So this is the, uh, how many do you, these do you think you need to do to feel reasonably confident that you're find, able, you're finding product market fit? And I'm gonna call on fun guy, just throw out a number. Like how, many, how many interviews, customer discovery interviews do you need to make? Hmm? 50. 50, okay. 25. All the way in the back, dinosaur. Okay, well, you're definitely in the right direction. So when I first saw that number, I do this for a living, by the way, and it was at the National Science Foundation, one of their i programs, where we were one of 30 teams from the universities across the country. And I saw that and I said, where did you get that number? And they said, well, we actually don't have scientific proof of this too, but we've been doing this for a long time. And what we have found that those who stop short of 100 end up not quite really knowing their market, not having product market fit. And since I've been looking at this 100, for my teams that have done it correctly, asked the questions the right way and done up to 100, 100% 100 of them have ended up doing something different. So I'm just trying to say this is well worth your time and don't cut it short. Keep notes, um, assess, um, modify your business thesis as needed, uh, change your questions. So the benefits again, avoid the unnecessary pivots, which is usually lost time and money. They're giving you the compelling sales pitch, telling you what it is they're looking for, the value. Prioritize what is most important. So here's a little story about that. Um, I'm drawing a blank on this name too. Um, the founder of LinkedIn, Hastings. Um, he was on a panel. This is like eight years after LinkedIn had launched and it was being used by millions of people. And he said in the early days, he said, we had five features that we thought was essential for the MVP before we launched. He said, we had written four and we were out of money. 
So the big decision was, do we launch with four or do he, does he go out and raise more money? And he said, which is lost time. He says, and I hate it because every time I do that, I'm giving away part of our company. Um, but the team was adamant that it would be an inadequate, inadequate experience. It's like building four fifths of a bridge. Um, and it was a waste of the time and money unless they had that fifth feature. So we decided he went home that night and he thought about it. He slept on it and he came back in the next day and assisted we're launching the four. And the, the, the team almost mutinied. They just thought it was the worst mistake ever. And Reed said, well, I'm the CEO. I got the majority shares. We're launching with four. So here he is eight years later sitting on this panel. And he said, you know what? We never wrote the fifth. Before customer discovery, they would have wasted time and money um, if, because they thought the fifth one was important, um, but they didn't actually go out and do it. So you'll learn more about the competition. You'll actually get the pros and cons, what people like, uh, how much people are paying for it. Um, you'll really get to know your target audience. When you talk to them, you can hear the enthusiasm and interest. Are they leaning in or do, do they get excited? Uh, like the law enforcement officers I was talking to, I could tell they were passionate about this problem. You're building the relationship. So nobody, when you walk in and just say, here, I'm gonna ask you some questions. Nobody sits there and says, oh boy, get out your checkbook and write you a check. Sales is a process and your goal always in sales is to get to the next meeting. And that this is, again, if you're not trying to sell them anything, you're just trying to learn about them, learn about their problems. Uh, that again, it's like forming a relationship. So uh, by the way, I'm an angel investor, invested like in 35 different businesses. And this was with Blue Tree. And one of the questions I always ask you is tell me about your customer discovery. And if you tell me you talk to 10 people, you don't have my, you don't have credibility with me. Um, really good pitchers when they get up and pitch and say through our customer discovery process where we talk to 150 people, blah, blah, blah. Now you have my attention. Um, but you're also looking through this, there are gonna be some people who are, you really relate well to, really gives you a lot of information, a lot of help. And these are people that what I call can be reference customers. So fall in love with the problem, not your solution. So then you go on to validation. And now that I know I'm solving the right problem, am I solving it the right way? And that's when you talk about your solution, which by the way, will be different than what you're thinking it is right, probably right at the moment. And um, go back to those that you interviewed, you could put a little asterisk next to their name that were most helpful. And then after you said, you know, you were so helpful for me and I have come up with a solution that I believe, and they're gonna kind of pair it back what they said, what they were looking for. Um, can you just give me your opinion about whether this is a good way to solve it or not? And everybody who has done this right ends up having at least one customer will say, God, can I try this? So they opt in. You don't have to go convince somebody to do the pilots. So, and that is golden. When you get around to doing, um, trying to raise money, having a reference customer, and ideally, if you can get them pay a little bit for it, just to validate that they'll pay something, your conversation changes. Anybody who's ever raised money will tell you that. As soon as you, that's traction. So there is a lengthy appendix um, with different case studies, um, B2B and different types, and then a, less, a little bit about what investors are looking for, um, which again, this is on our website. It will be on the uh, Schwartz Sellers Workshop archives. So I'm gonna just, uh, stop. Oh, by the way, there's numbers next to our page numbers in the presentation, not uh, 80 analyses. So uh, I'm just going to stop for a minute just to ask if there were any questions in chat. Nope. Or if anybody has any questions you want to put in chat, and Allison is going to read them out. While she's looking, then I'm just gonna go quickly to the competitive analysis, because this is a dual thing. Um, Any way they're solving the problem now is the competition. So there's direct and there's indirect. So um, who is Uber's competition? Shout it out. 
Okay, that's direct. What is the indirect competition? Test off. Say again? Tesla. Tesla? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, they're, they're providing, instead of being a, another ride-share company, they actually come in as the auto, auto oh. manufacturer. Okay. So, but it also could be the bus. It could be those scooters. It could be rental cars, zip cars. Um, so that's what I call indirect competition. They aren't solving it the same way Uber's doing it. But what the problem the customer is trying to solve is to get from A to B. You know, so it's a, um, you have to think sort of more broadly about what it is. So I anyway, just went that. So when you do this, it's just simply a messy Excel spreadsheet. So competitors on one side and then whatever their features are that go across. And here's some examples of features. It could be, well, I'm not gonna read them all to you, but some ideas of the different things that you wanna look for. And your customers are telling you this during the interviews about what they like, what they don't like, um, what's missing, and um, it, with past things that they have tried before or are currently using now. And as I said, it's messy. This is actually pretty clean because you wanna put anything you want in there. When you're finally getting around to pitching for money, you're gonna find that there's gonna be certain competitors that are right in that sweet spot and you want to um, um, sort of focus on them, uh, not necessarily in everything. So here's just different ways of portraying this. Um, this one, in this case, put themselves down on the right. I would suggest you put yourself, it's the first column, or put yourself at the top. And by the way, we even make jokes about this at, at the angel investor meetings. You know, I say I've got all the checks, but this is a very simple way actually preserved about what really matters. Um, whoa, did I move ahead? Anyway, out of order. Okay. So after you do all this, you would just ask yourself, is it a really big problem? And there's an old saying, is it 10 times better or three times cheaper? Need to have, and is it something that will attract investors? So investors are not investing in your company. And the way they make their money is by selling your company. So you want to say it's a big market opportunity that somebody will buy it. Will it scale? And I will just say that the two things that most of my startups that I work with, and it's been over a thousand since I've been doing this from here at CMU, sale, sales and scales. Everybody thinks that'll just fly off the shelf. That's not the case at all. Sometimes your market's very fragmented. Like I had somebody who was selling products to doctors. There are 500,000 of them in the US. I said, what are you gonna do? Go around, knock door to door, try and call them on the phone. How are you gonna reach them? I hadn't really thought about that, but they're gonna love it. Well, how are they gonna find out about it? Um, and the other one is scale. And so learning how to particularly scaling sales. So anyway, so, um, so that's why I have down there, you know, how will you sell this? I actually have people starting to think about this by at least the second time I meet with them because it, it can be an issue. All right, then I have the case study. So I don't know what, oh, got a question, good. How do you ensure enough diversity amongst your interviews? Enough diversity amongst your interviews? Um, by that, I mean, are you talking to enough people? And, and different types of people. So one of the things you should do, if you go back and look at the risk call example, he had in a hospital, the different types of stakeholders that were important. And as you start to interview them, you'll figure out which ones matter more. Um, they either have more information, they care more, they have a bigger role to play. Uh, so when I, say 100 interviews. For example, he went to uh, four hospitals and two nursing homes. And he interviewed you know, anywhere from eight to 10 people, uh, at least a minimum in each of those. And so you don't have to interview you know, 100 hospitals. What you need to do is interview a um, number of people in the hospitals and making sure you have diversity in your shareholders. And 
uh, look at sometimes is it matter if it's a small hospital or a large hospital? Uh, is it in a rural area? Is it in the city area? So, um, I mean, if you work with me or anybody else in the Schwartz Center, we'll sort of challenge you on that um, to make sure that you um, don't limit yourself too much and just getting the same answers from the same group of people. Are we done? Is it any more? Yeah, I'm ready. Okay. Would you make any Would I make any adjustments to how I do my customer discovery during the COVID? Um, we have been working now with some national teams from the NSFI Corps, plus our current, what I call book of business, those who applied to uh, Project Olympus. And what we have actually found in many ways, that as long as you're talking person to person, it could be face to face is great, but Zoom works fine. And actually, as I said, in many cases, you're able to get more interviews because it's, um, you don't have to travel. What is missing, which is really hard, and one of the best places is to go to a trade show where all your customers are there at the same time. And for example, when you participate in our NSFI Corps program, there is some funding currently that many use to actually go to those trade shows. So it pays for your travel and your admission. Um, and that is invaluable um, because it's so efficient and you don't necessarily do all the interviews there, but what you can certainly do is you can find all the people are there. They give you registrations lists. You can pick up business cards. So that's the only thing I would really change if when we get out of COVID and they start to have these trade shows again. That's it. Okay, well, again, it's, kit at cmu.edu. If you have any questions, it's easy to find me. And